So, um, good afternoon. Vitaite. Welcome, everyone, to the first of the uh, Globsec City Talks, at least for today. Uh, my name is Kathleen Koch. I am uh, an American, former American journalist from the United States. I've worked for 18 years for a cable news network, CNN. So you may have seen me in front of the White House or on Capitol Hill or in front of a plane crash or on the Gulf Coast reporting on Hurricane Katrina. And as a journalist, um, I, I find people's stories fascinating. And so I think we are really in for quite a treat here today because um, I have with me on my panel um, three of the most fascinating men from this corner of Europe to share the really unique and incredible stories that I think really reflect the, the dynamism, the, the energy, and the potential in this part of the world today. So um, I will, I'm sure you all know them, but I will quickly run, run down the list. Um, sitting immediately next to me is um, Adam Shomlai Fisher. Um, he's co-founder of Prezi. And that's, if you haven't heard of it, a presentation product that is used by more than 55 million people on the planet today. Uh, next to him, our host, Robert Vash, without whom none of us would be here for this wonderful event, um, founder of Globesec some 10 years ago today. So, so 10 years this week, I guess, you know, celebrating its, its 10 year anniversary. And um, he is also uh, president and, and CEO of the Central European Strategy Council. And then finally, um, last but not least, is Tomas Hendrik Ilves, president of the Republic of Estonia. So we are going to start um, this afternoon with Adam. Adam's got, uh, being from Prezi, he has a presentation for you. So Adam, take it away. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can I please have my presentation? Can I keep my time nicely? So, um, I'm from Prezi. It's a presentation software that I'm going to be using, so you're going to see what it is. And what I thought I'd tell you, talk to you about is our story of um, what we learned from growing and starting from this tiny town south of here called Budapest and making it to where we are today. And half of it will be what we learned in the US and the second half will be, I think, something of an inspirational motivational part for you that you can do the same if you would like to with a lot of work. So basically, um, we have a very nice office in San Francisco and a very nice one in Budapest. And San Francisco is a great place because you learn so much there. Everybody is about great products, global products, global success there. So that's just filled with knowledge. Budapest, my hometown, is something that's my personal place. That's my friends and family live. You know, it's an emotional link. And it's the same for our micro founders. So we wanted to build a company that ties the two cities together and doesn't just move to the US and that's it. Um, a few words about our, where we are today, so you can position us. Um, of course, like anything else, it started in a, a small place. These are my co-founders, Peter, Halachi, and Arvai. Um, tiny room, working day and night. Of course, no money spent, no money made, but believing in a vision. And today, we are like 270 people from uh, 27 countries in the two offices. And, you know, of course, there's a lot of great people using our tool. It's used on TED a lot. Uh, my favorite one is in education. This was our first success um, around the globe. A lot of people, you know, a lot of teachers and a lot of students started using it very early on. And we have poor schools in the US and we got a thank you from the president, Obama, which was very nice. But, and we get a lot of good news out of this place of the world. We are very proud of that. There's not only bad news coming from our, our country. But this is not what I wanted to talk about, right? So this is just like blah, 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 the shameless plug. So, what are the things that I learned during this journey? First of all, when you are in Silicon Valley, everybody, even if it's a bit ridiculous, if they have a coffee shop in the corner, they dream very big. You know, they say, I'm gonna be there, global, great. And even though this is a bit strange, you have to understand that if you set your goals medium or low, you're never gonna reach beyond them because you set up everything to reach that goal. Maybe you, it's Prezi, that's always the same for us, like let's, let's win the German market and we do everything for that. But we are not aiming global, we won't really make it. Um, the second thing I think is really interesting that 
and it was amazing for me traveling and living in many, many successful uh, cities, is that the basic assumption is trust. If you meet, if you have a new colleague, a new person you work with, you are assuming, oh, they're going to be so great. This is going to be great working together. Here we have a troubled past, a lot of non-functioning states, non-functioning societies. And our first impression is always like, maybe there's something fishy here, I don't know. And you know, that really slows down the work. So we, we try to learn that how we build trust in our company. Um, then um, in Silicon Valley and in that part of the world, there's a lot, a lot about a lot of the companies are about their culture, about how they work together. The famous quote is, you know, at Google, they have like this 20% free time. It's not really true. But, you know, there's the idea that you, you develop a culture because a company is, in English, a company means like a set of people together. It's a nice thing. There's nothing evil about it. So you can create something great where people actually enjoy their time together. And in our case, for example, uh, we don't have working hours because all the people we work with are grown-ups and they like our vision and they work as much as their work-life balance makes them and you know what they can manage. Um, this is great, for example, in many countries, many companies in the Valley, and this is true for us too, we celebrate failure. If you break something, you can break a really big server, it's really damaging. What you do, you stand up and you say publicly that I broke this and this is what I learned. And people are going to applaud and you know, be really happy for you. They're not going to blame you. And this is really important because if you cannot fail, you will not try. If you cannot fail, you will not you know, push the boundaries. And we need every single one in our company to be really smart and try you know, to do the really most important things, even if they can be risky. Um, and the last thing which, uh, which we really love is that it is actually quite common in the, in the US to, for a company to have a to stand behind the policy or have a vision about the society that they want to support. And in our case, we, are we have a lot of charity projects, but one example is that, of course, we stand for diversity. We intentionally try to make our company very diverse in its nationalities. But for example, we started a movement with some companies to, to support the pride movement in Hungary, which is not, not that popular. Um, and we had this, you know, it's, it was actually working really well. We said that we are a company and you can trust us because we make money and we think pride is good. <laughs> so people started to believe it and join us in this movement, which I think is quite a nice thing. Now, so these are, you might even have heard of these things like failure and, and vision. Now I'm going to tell you some things which I think are interesting. So I met this person, he's uh, the mayor of San Francisco, we were in Mexico touring and promoting entrepreneurship. Of course he was there because he's from San Francisco. I was there because we built a great company and I'm not American and from Mexico's point of view, from the Mexican's point of view, this was a great news that you don't have to be born American to do a great company in Silicon Valley. So that was my position. But basically he told me that 40% of the uh, people living in the city are born overseas. 40%, right? Almost every second person you meet on the street. Um, here's one more thing. In 2009 we were a tiny company in Budapest in a small town south of here. Um, we got an email from the city of San Francisco trying to convince us to move there. A small company in a remote, tiny country and from the, you know, from the capital of this industry. I think something would be the similar if, if Bratislava's council will decide that they look for tiny, interesting companies in the world and they try to convince them to come here. Why? Because San Francisco's role, even if it's taxpayers' money, it's not only to help all the American companies and the people there, but to create a strong business culture with the best people and the best ideas possible. So, if this is true, and if we went uh, there, did we bring anything with us? Was it just like we go to San Francisco and buy by Europe? What I did, I asked all, all our, well, some of our uh, American employees, employees who are from Silicon Valley or that region and they are US citizens. If there is anything in Prezi that they think is not typical to a US company, anything that they think it's something unique to us coming from this part of the world. And here are some examples. Um, this person said that we are really transparent in how we make decisions. We explain everything, they can see through the whole thing. And her assumption was that this is because we have a troubled political past, we don't trust authority, so we want everybody to know everything. I think this is actually true, and it's great for a company. Um, second thing, this person loved that our feedback, when we give feedback to people, is really honest. It's not sugar-coated. It's not just trying to be nice every time. It's really valuable because of this. Um, 
A lot of people said actually that they think that we are humble. Somehow culture is not about me, 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 I am the best in the world, but about us and you know, do things together. And they actually love this. They have enough of that very individualistic uh, standpoint. Um, again, we don't have policies, we just have a set of values that we really like. And because of this, there are not that many rules at our company. And some people think this is not so common there. By the way, these are our values. I'm not going to get into that. I have two, one and a half more minutes. Um, and this is again interesting. We did Prezi and we do Prezi because we really love uh, helping people, how they share ideas. I, I've been presenting like this since a decade. I wrote it for myself originally. And when we started the company with my co-founders, we really set out that this is a great tool that helps people being more creative, more effective, how they communicate. And the company, the money, it's an essential tool to achieve this goal, but it's not the goal itself. And this is very sincere from me. And yes, a lot of American employees are very proud of this, that we are not like a bank, or I don't know, or a bad bank. Okay, um, I'm going to skip this. Now, so to my conclusion. Sorry, I will read it up because it's a bit burned out. So yes, uh, starting from here, moving there, and staying here as well, we learned a lot, we had to learn a lot. There were so many things we didn't know. That city and that region is full of knowledge that we have to embrace and understand and grow. But we also brought things with us. It wasn't that we just went there and everything disappeared, that who we were. So I think it's actually quite a nice, nice news to you. Um, so when you talk to the global market, and I've been here, this was my position, like small company, somebody from here, to the big global market, you have this kind of inferiority complex that, oh, they won't care, I don't know, I'm too small, I'm from here. Um, but in reality, what happens is that if you say something interesting, wherever you go in the world, if it's an interesting product, people will listen and like it. One of our VCs, when we talked about investment, we talked for an hour about you know, the ideas and everything, and then he asked, oh, by the way, where are you guys from? They didn't care, there were no presumptions that if you're from Eastern Europe, you must be not so good at this and that. And I think this is actually great news. So. We are a very successful species, society, as in humanity together. We massively impact this planet. And I would like to ask you to be smart and, and do global things so you have an impact on this work to keep its diversity, because I think that's going to be a much, much nicer future. And if there's one thing you can do to help me, I just want to ask you to convince the city council to invite a company from a remote place of this planet. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Adam. Lots of wonderful ideas for our discussion. Really impressive. Um, President Ilvesen, do you mind if I call you Tomas? Sure. I'd like to go to you now to talk to us about your small country and how you have managed to become perhaps the most wired and technologically advanced nation on the face of the earth that virtually anyone can now become an citizen of. All right, I'll try to be brief. It's a long story, but I'll try to be brief. Basically, when we in Estonia, we uh, <coughs> basically occupied by the Soviets and the Nazis and the Soviets 50 years. Occupation is a part of your history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A long one. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we became, we reestablished our independence in 1991. And, you know, we had, we were so, uh, we missed, had missed out on all of the infrastructure development of Western Europe. And we, uh, you look at it, you know, putting, making new roads, bridges, and all that will take decades. Uh, and so it's pretty, de pretty depressing. Um, and I mean, at the technological level, we had, we had a 1938 telephone exchange in the capital. Uh, I mean, this was, you know, rotaries, and never always got the wrong connection. Uh, so I was, so, I, uh, and I was actually sitting in Washington at the time because I was the first ambassador after independence in Washington. And sort of going, what are we going to do? This is really bad. We're really poor. And the other thing that was sort of the motivational factor was that Finland, which is right across the bay from us, uh, I, we were at the same level of development in 1939. There was a 13 times different, fold difference in GDP per capita between our two countries after this 50 years of occupation. So, you know, and it's, uh, 
we're not quite like, uh, we're not as close to uh, Hungarian, uh, but we Estonian and Finnish are very closely related languages. You could watch, only part of the Soviet Union then, you could watch Western television, so everyone sort of looked at what we could do. Uh, and then a couple of things happened. One is that uh, I, I had this little brainwave that we're actually, okay, we're, it's gonna take forever to build these roads or whatever it is, ports. But one place we're in a level playing field, in July 1993 was uh, the first web browser, uh, Mosaic, came out. And we were like, well, I mean, it's new in the United States, it's new in Estonia, I mean, well, we're on a level playing field, we can do this. Um, uh, so, and we did have a lot of people who were really smart in uh, tech already, so, well, I'm so that's one thing. Then I read this neo-Marxist, neo-Luddite book by Jeremy Rifkin called The End of Work, which is about how computerization is going to be terrible because everyone's going to lose a job. And he had this example there of a steel mill in Kentucky that employed 12,000 people and produced X million tons of steel. And then the Japanese bought it. This is back when the Japanese were buying everything. They completely automized the plant. And then they had 120 people producing the same amount of steel. And of course, he was brought this as an example of how terrible all this is. And I, and, but our anxiety in Estonia, we're so small. I mean, how can we compete? This is at a time when everyone's writing about economies of scale. You know, and, you know, there are a lot of companies that are bigger than my country. So it's, <laughs> so I, but I said, this is great. We should computerize everything because then we can't, uh, then we can, our functional size can be much greater. So uh, then I sort of pu started pushing the government at the time to basically computerize the schools. Because the other thing from my background is I learned to program at age 13. Um, that was 48 years ago, I'm 61 now. But I mean, I had this crazy math teacher who taught us how to program. Um, and so I said, well, you can learn that as, as a kid and that's what the future is about. Uh, and so they actually listened to me and they, they instituted a program to actually put schools online. And by 1997, all schools were online. The computer education was very good because, you know, and there's a lot of opposition from the teachers because they, cause kids learn better, faster than adults. But I always, I figured always four or five percent of the kids will go and try to figure something out themselves, which turned out 15 years later turned out to be true. Uh, but th that was kind of the beginning and the backdrop to that. Um, and the other lesson, which is important, I think, for everyone uh, is the, to avoid legacy technology. Because when we became independent, the Finns wanted to give us a 1979 telephone exchange. It was an analog exchange. The reason they wanted to give it to us for free was because they were going digital. And the government was again, yeah, well, let's do this. We get it for free. And I said, no, Good do, for you. Not, do not take it. No any second hand here. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that was the lesson of World War I, actually, or the Versailles Treaty, where basically the Brits and the French stripped the German industrial plant took it home and they were still using, you know, then they were using 1890s German technology in the 1940s and 50s. The Germans, of course, went and built everything new. Uh, so we didn't want to do that. And then so then slowly what happened is that people started getting into this and we started having brighter and brighter kids. And then the thing that really worked was that there were four kids at the time who got together and uh, first of all came up with a uh, music file exchange program called Kazaa. Uh, and it was, <laughs> and then after they were indicted by the FBI, <laughs> and were going to go to jail because this is, they didn't like that in the U.S. Uh, anyway, they got off, and then they were, then they invented something new, which was called Skype. Uh, and so suddenly, four kids from Estonia, from this, you know, I mean, Budapest is a, it's a metropolis compared to Estonia. I mean, it's like you know, we're this tiny little backwater up there in northern, northeastern Europe, and. And suddenly these kids, you know, I mean, their product is all over the world. So that encouraged even more people to do stuff. Um, that's sort of the beginning of it. The other thing we did was um, uh, we realized that uh, precisely because you can do a lot of things in IT that uh, require fewer people, we started computerizing services. First thing we computerized actually was uh, taxes. So we have... So pe already in sort of the end of the 90s, people were filling, doing their taxes online. You get the whole thing in front of you. You say, you look at it and say, if it's okay, you press a button and you're... And you file in five minutes. And, and Americans are so jealous. Well, this is, uh, 
Uh, and then we, well, we had, we incentivized it. We said, well, if you, if you file it online, you get your refund right away. And if you do it on paper, because we have to read it all, it'll take a, a long time. And so basically what's happened over time is we've added more and more services online. Um, and now basically, I mean, okay, Estonia, in fact, mo your most interactions between citizens and the government are done online. There are, what I learned, and actually where I first heard of Prezi was I had headed the, um, the European Commission Task Force on eHealth. Uh, and uh, and I thought it would be all technology, and it turned out it was all legal. And this is one of the things that has to be understood when, if you're going to go for for an EE country, is that you really have to make sure your legal frameworks are there. And that's a lot of the hard work has been done on that end. So, for example, in my country, every citizen owns his or her own data, which is key to getting anything done. And then that'll, and then we also have a once-only law that means that the government may never ask you for any information it already has. But in order to—that's sweet. So you don't have to <laughs> fill out an, a form right. every yes, time yes. you go to a government right. office. Yes. Well, no one goes. <laughs> Endless to reams office, of right. paperwork. You never have wow. to do that. But in order to do that, then we realize you need a secure identity, which is where the problems come in because uh, countries are not willing to, or citizens are not willing to have a s strong ID, which we have. And a couple of other countries have them, but it's a chip-based, two-factor thing where basically I, I argue that's the only way we can go in the future if you want to be secure. Um, anyway, so we this has slowly been happening, and then and then uh, then what started happening then was because of this, people started doing all kinds of innovative stuff, um, also sort of in the in this civil society sector. So you can go online. There's this movement called Let's Do It World org, which is an, was an, again, the guys from Skype invented a, an app to take pictures of garbage and giving the location of it. And then what we had was this cleanup campaign. And people would, so we, and then we had a logistics company also do the software for the logistics. And now this, this, this thing is taking place in 99 countries in the world. Um, and it's, we just give the app away, you know, and it's just used, and uh, people who want to clean up their country use this. Amazing. We, we now take the system that we have developed for the data exchange, and that is our foreign aid. We, give it, we just give it to countries. We say, here's the operating system. You want to build it up, build it out, do what you want to do with it, whatever, you can do it, but here's the, the software to do it. It's open source, uh, non-proprietary software. So and why not sell it? Well, 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 first of all, the government bought it. So the government owns it. So, I mean, it's, it bought it in the sense that it did a tender and a bunch of software engineers developed it. And, well, so it's there. And so, I mean, it's easier. We've already bought it once. So now we can give it away to, I mean, we give it, I mean, Moldova. We gave it to Moldova. Moldova's implemented it and works great. You know, it's, uh, some other countries you give it to, it's not so great, but it's, I mean, we can give it away. So anyway, so, this, so what's happened now is that Estonia is Estonia, and uh, for example, right now I'm co-chairing the World Bank's first ever report on IT and development. You'd think they'd get around to it a long time ago, but <laughs> they're only wow. doing it now. <laughs> uh, but it's because they looked at countries, and I guess this is the final list. They looked at countries, who's doing really well, who's really advanced. It was Estonia, Finland, and Singapore. But they said, but the difference between the, uh, is that Singapore and Finland began doing this when they were rich. We started doing this when we were poor. And so there must be something in there that we did right to get to where we are. Uh, and we're always happy to have people come and look at what we do, and we're happy to give away our software, or at least the operating system, and you can do what you want with it. Uh, and wish I, I should have done a Prezi presentation here. It would have worked much better. <laughs> I'll work on it. I'll work on it. And then the citizenship aspect, right? That's one of the well, newest residency. Items. It's not citizenship. residency. Okay, yeah, I mean, residency. And uh, e-resident, not e-citizen. Yeah, I mean, well, the difference is that we we can vote online, and we do. Um, and basically, thirty-four percent of the population votes online. Uh, but uh, residency, you can't. Uh, citizenship, you you vote. Residency, you can use the various services. So, you, I mean, we have a digital signature, which you can sign anything. I mean, these are not really. I mean, these are things that actually are completely, there's nothing new or 
anything, it's just that they're not implemented. Uh, there's an EID directive in Europe that you know, allows you to have digital legal signature, li signature that is legally valid across Europe, but you just can't do it in most countries. I mean, <laughs> that's the problem. But I mean, so the l but the laws at least are there for that. Uh, so re you can do sign legal documents and well, I mean, you can do all kinds of things. But there are all kinds of services that you have in this sense that, <coughs> excuse me, that um, we have, and uh, we would like to see the rest of Europe have. For example, we have digital prescriptions. 99.999% of the prescriptions in Estonia, you go to a doctor, you put it in your computer, and you can go to any pharmacy in the country, stick in your card, put in your code, and you get your, uh, your prescription. Now, the r sort of logical no-brainer would be that, well, Finland has this too, uh, sort of, I mean, not for everybody, but, you know, why don't you do it so that if you're, you come to Estonia, you get sick, you lost, or you lost your prescription, you go to an Estonian pharmacy, and, but in, you're already in, in Finland, for having, you know, penicillin or something, and then you pick it up, and then the lo ultimate logical step would be that throughout the European Union, I mean, if you are visiting, if I'm in Bratislava and I suddenly sort of need something, I call my doctor and he goes, okay, I put it in the computer, you go to the pharmacy in Bratislava, stick in your card, put in your number, and you get your thing. Uh, and then you can move on to all thinking about all kinds of other services, health records, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's certainly where I would like to see the European Union go. I just think it's going to take a long, long time. And how many e-residents do you have now? I don't know what we, where we are. I guess... 12,000, I mean, it's not, we just started this thing, so That's it's not. That's exciting. I, I sat actually at dinner last night next to the very first um, e-resident of uh, the journalist, Ed Lucas, right, right, he was on a panel of mine last year mm -hmm. uh, here at, at GlobeSec, and he, he pulled out the card, he said, look, 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 I'm an e-resident of Estonia. <laughs> well, he also he liked that zero, 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 one is Estonia. <laughs> Speaking of Globsec, let's uh, move to you, Robert. I just think this the story of, of Globsec is astonishing because 10 years ago, you were 21, and you and a group of other students, four or five of you, said, hey, let, let's do this thing. And audience of 100, 150 or so. And now here you are today with uh, perhaps the, the, the preeminent, the most respected security conference in this region. Did, Tell us how you got there, and I mean, did you ever even imagine 10 years ago that this is where you'd be? No, and how, how we got, got here? Uh, well, the short uh, version is that I woke up, invented Globsec, and did it. <laughs> but that's not true. Uh, Sounds it so is, uh, easy. It is a little <laughs> bit, uh, little bit more, more difficult. Uh, first of all, what you have to have is a free society. If you don't have a free society, you can't have individual projects uh, you can build on. And we take uh, the values of democracy, freedom, uh, and all the values that the Euro-Atlantic community is built upon as granted. But they are not. And we see it today in Ukraine with the tensions in, or, uh, in, uh, with Russia, etc. Our parents had to fight for these values. And you need also individuals who can take advantage of those values. We live today in a very cynical world where everything is bad. Government is bad, Americans are bad, Brussels is bad, Russians are bad, Hungarians, everybody. So we are, we are living in a very, very cynical world. But in 25 years, there are very inspirational stories. Estonia, great country who, who, which made it to the forefront of, of, of a digital, di digital age from a small country to be one of the first ones to di digitalize almost everything which, which is possible. Uh, inspirational story from Hungary with Prezi, going global from a small uh, central European city. Uh, we have Slovak stories like Eset, uh, which has gotten global, uh, Sajik and many others. And I started when I was 21, uh, with a conference. I was studying international relations in Banska Bistrica and uh, it was uh, 2004 when we joined EU and NATO and uh, uh, at that time uh, my country was in a mood, okay, we made it, we are in, relax, we got it. 
that's the end. <laughs> now, um, we did not agree with that because being part of NATO and EU is not the goal, it's just a tool. And if you don't use that tool, you know, you, you don't transform it to opportunities. So we, need, we, we wanted to show, show something before we end our un university that Slovakia is not only just a small country, but we can influence thi things. And there were a lot of inspirational stories from similar countries as uh, Denmark, uh, Belgium, etc., which are very successful in international scenes. So as students, uh, we came up with the idea that we want to bring uh, a world debate to Bratislava. And especially here, it is very difficult because uh, Slovakia was always part of something. It was a part of Austro-Hungarian monarchy, then it was part of Czechoslovakia, and it was part of something else. And we always were, okay, so, so they will decide and we'll adapt. And we, when we wanted to transform this, this thinking that actually we want to come up with solutions on the international scene and not just wait for what, what is coming here from Brussels, from Washington and Berlin, but let's be at the table and let's discuss and decide how Europe should look like. So you this wanted was to the lead instead idea. of follow. Sorry? You wanted to lead instead of follow. Exactly. And um, the past of this region was that we were always on the periphery. We were more uh, objects of international policy than subjects. So first of all, we wanted to be on, uh, at the table. And all the solutions uh, uh, which were made in the international uh, scene were discussed in Brussels. And we wanted to put Bratislava on the map of European and global thinking. We didn't know after for first year that we will be, uh, whether we will be successful. Uh, we wanted to just start off our careers. But after the first year, uh, when we were successful, we decided that we'll put everything into that. We didn't have money, we didn't have telephone, we didn't have a bank account. Uh, we just put our spare money that we earned during uh, 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 during uh, some some works and invested into that project. We didn't know whether it will succeed, uh, but after first, second, and third year, uh, we've seen that it is possible. Uh, and today, uh, we are an organization uh, of 36 uh, full staff employees. We are doing 60 projects in 18 countries. And today's conference was just covered in American media, in British media, and it was worldwide covered conference. So actually from a small country in a small city, you can influence the world debate on very important issues that are going on. And it means that the size of a country is not the main condition whether you will succeed, uh, but is the intellectual capacity that you are able to produce even in a small city like Bratislava. But first of all, um, the main issue is that failure is the key to success. You need to be prepared to fail. If you are not prepared to fail, you will not succeed. Because after 10 years, the success of Globsec looks like a linear success. Growth every year, every year at the conference. But we had a lot of bumps at the road. And Lots of people along the way probably said, this, you can't do this. <laughs> You're yeah, crazy, and, right? And our idea is if we reach some level, we need to push it even further, further. And it is always harder and harder, but always easier in a sense because you have a brand. And if you build up a brand, you can work with it. And the credibility of brand is very important. But being uh, 21 years old in an international diplomatic community, which is very traditional and very conservative, based on the age and seniority, it was very tough for a 21-year student to persuade uh, your partners that you're able to do something uh, which is worth uh, how, following. How did you get them to take you seriously? <laughs> well, uh, I was sending emails instead of uh, meeting. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Didn't know uh, who is behind. No. Um, but I've seen the faces in the first two or three years of Globsec when I was welcoming somebody, and they were asking me, where's the boss? <laughs> ah, that's me. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, they what? seen the young face uh, uh, behind, and uh, many of them were surprised. Well, Robert, I, I have to confess, um, I, when I met you and, and Milan Solar, um, this was two years ago at the Halifax International Security Forum in, in um, Canada, 
uh, it was an old friend of mine, Kurt Volker, who brought them up and introduced them to me. And you said, you know, we like the way you moderate. We would like you to come to our to Slovakia to our uh, you know our conference and moderate for us. And I was thinking, hmm, these so these young college interns they have a they have a <laughs> security forum at their university wh whatever i said to send me the information I'll, I'll look at it but i i had no idea and then when you sent the information i'd never heard of globosec before mm. and i i investigated and i was i, I was quite impressed no I'm we quite were taken aback. we were investing a lot of uh, into the branding into the innovation and technologies we use uh, a special app for the conference we have a globosec tv a special globosec daily today we have invested a lot into trailers, uh, et cetera. So from the beginning, you have to have global ambitions because if you don't have a global ambitions, if you set your goals too low, you stay too low. Uh, that's a problem. But also managing expectations is very important because you have to build up a group of people who are believing in your idea. And if you are picturing that idea, which is too far, but you persuade them you can reach it, and you don't reach it, the, it is very disappointing for everyone. And there are a lot of people who are then uh, demotivated uh, not to continue, and there are a lot of them. So the most important thing is to keep the motivation high, whatever happens, and whatever problem and bumps come into the road. Because if you are unable to go through them, you are you're unable to continue. Thomas, I'd like to um, bring you in, and, and Adam as well. Your, your thoughts, when I hear these stories, uh, it sounds like all three of you have succeeded enormously against all odds. And, and obviously, there were probably, as I was mentioning to Robert, plenty of people who said, you're crazy, this won't work. Plenty of times, you considered quitting. So is there something special in the DNA in this part of the world that, that gives you this optimism, this will, this, this determination? to persevere. <laughs> well, I always get really annoyed at East European defeatism and, oh, we can't do anything. Oh, we have blah, blah. I mean, this kind of, you know, why bother? You know, everyone is bigger. We're, you know, we're, a g we're too small. Yeah, we're too right. poor. Yeah. No one will listen to us. And um, So your history is an albatross around your neck. That right, and I, I, just, I just don't, I mean, that, I mean, that's a broad, general sort of attitude that I think is, uh, uh, well, it's just you have to overcome that. And I mean, you know, what I t described took about 20 years. And I mean, like, you know, for the first five, it was, it was I mean, everyone was trashing this idea. And then, and then when it started happening, then, then about after a year, was saying, well, it, it died. It didn't work, you know. And that Keep doing it and keep doing it. Did you have personal doubts along the way that it would work? No, I had no doubts whatsoever. It was the only thing was that whether you could, p whether it would find the acceptance in the public that would go with it, uh, and trying to figure out how to do it. I w I'm well. I'm, I've been always convinced that this is the way to go, and society is going that way. Adam. Yeah, you can actually get, get motivated by this constant complaining because it's so annoying that you just want to prove yourself. Like, no, this is not true. Come on, let's work very hard for a decade. And then people then believe you and they listen. Um, actually, uh, one of my co-founders, Peter Arvey, he's half Swedish. And when we were discussing that he, he joined and we start together the company, his uncle was driving him to the airport and he was complaining all along the way. Peter had a very nice job in New York, and you know it wasn't easy for us to convince that he joins. But because of that, <laughs> he got so annoyed of his uncle. He was like, "No, I'm gonna prove you wrong. This is stupid. You can't live like this." They can build from this. But actually, my biggest motivation when I when it comes to really to, to the real <laughs> real source was that during university, I was I was really using my time into putting everything into a uh, youth NGO, Euro Atlantic Center. And three years, I, you know, we, we made a lot of seminars, a lot of gatherings. We had Slovak politicians in at university, etc. And I was quite proud of that. And then my friends, who were always going to the beer, came to me. Robert, you are always playing on something. You just, what is this you're doing? Just do something which will be visible. And I was like, 
like three years I'm, I'm <laughs> investing into something and somebody tells me that is nothing. And it, it so motivated me, so I, then I go, went home and wanted to prove that there are people who are capable of doing something. So complaining is a motivation. Is that a motivation. It's so <laughs> interesting because I, I find that in, in the United States too, but I wonder what, what it is that makes the difference in the person who hears the criticism, hears people saying you can't do it, and then gets discouraged and quits, and the person like the three of you who hears the criticism, uh, the, the naysayers, and says, and, and it steals your determination to keep going. What is that? Well, you do get depressed at times. I mean, I'll, <laughs> okay. be, I'll, I'll be honest. We're getting real and honest here. <laughs> so, but I mean, I, I think there's a, there is what I would call sort of uh, East European, Central European learned helplessness, which is this, uh, is this uh, sort of paradigm in uh, behavioral psychology, which was discovered by a guy named Martin Seligman uh, 45 years ago where if you get these uncontrollable shocks to dogs and they, they realize they can't do anything about it, and so they just give up. And so he developed this model of depression based on this thing that when dogs, and then later he had developed this for people, that if you're in a situation where nothing you do makes any difference, um, which is actually, I would say, was the condition of people under communism for 40, 50 years, which is that if you try try to do something new, try to do something something that isn't approved in, by the Central Committee, you will just be slapped down. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are only accepted ways of doing things, and that is going through the party, going through the Komsomol, or whatever, that people sort of gave up. And so there is this feeling that, I mean, it's, and I, it's, it's not just my country, I see it, I go, to, I go to so many countries where there's a feeling, oh, there's no point. I mean, it's changed dramatically in my country too. Now there's this whole thriving startup scene and people are trying to do stuff and it's all very different. But in the 90s, there was so much of this sort of defeatism mm. that why bother? I mean, you know, they're, they're, they, they are, are, are gonna get us anyway. They will invade us anyway. or They are gonna stop us from doing it anyway. Um, why try? <coughs> That's so interesting. But your your country has more startups per capita, correct, than any other country on the face well, of the planet. We have a lot. So I, I that, that's what. That's yeah, what's no, that's written what. Yeah, anyway. I mean, it's, it's it, there are a lot of very successful startups that are. I mean, we have things like TransferWise, which is we're doing all, all money transfers in Europe completely differently, and it's much cheaper. All kinds. Of, I mean, there are all there are all kinds of things, but it's they, it comes out of this. I would argue two things. One is a change in attitude. And the other one is that we have all kinds of people who have, after 15 years of an education, of educational sort of opportunities in IT, means that, uh, I mean, educational reforms take 15 years, or so minimum, 15, 20 years. So now we're bearing the fruit of kids who 10 years ago or 15 years ago got to go into a classroom and play with a computer and then decided they're going to become software engineers. What do you think, um, Adam, in this region's success uh, as these countries move forward, how important will this entrepreneurial spirit startups be? I think it's really key. A um, lot of people don't know that actually most jobs are created by new and small companies, not the big companies. And the public opinion is always supporting, oh, let, let's get a deal with that giant company, and they created 200 jobs, yes. And the government, and they got bribed, and you know. Um, so I think this is really key. And But I'm uh, even more excited about the cultural impact, because when you meet people who had experience personally that their own work had an impact on their life, that they did something, and it actually changed something in their life, then they share this story, and they tell others, and then others get motivated. And <coughs> We intentionally invest a lot of money into Hungarian PR. We don't have a business in Hungary. We don't make any money there. And the sole purpose is just to like <coughs> tell these stories that, that you know, you can actually do it today. And yes, our, our parents have opened the way for us. Yes, it is very clear that they were not allowed even to do private businesses. Um, but this is really key. And I have one more good news for us, I think, that Actually, I remember now when I changed and I, I believe that I can do a lot of big things. Is, and so I traveled a lot. I used to be an artist and it went better and better and I was still a bit cynical and like, I don't know. But then I saw that anywhere in the world, 
is this very hardworking minority who brings about change and who does the great things. This is the same in the US, same in Japan. And this is, yes, some things are easier, some things are harder. But if this is true, then you can be that hardworking minority here. You don't have to start by changing everybody right away. And then slowly, yes, it can take a decade, but slowly things will change. Um, and I don't know, I just felt this is, you know, this is great because if it's only about my hard work, I can probably do it. I think there's an interesting thread running through these stories, um, and, and you addressed it specifically in your presentation, Adam, <laughs> about the focus not being on making money. And so often in society, and certainly in the United States today, you know, that's the goal, the, the big job, the big bank account, the big house, you know, a million cars, the pool, the, all, all that. And it's interesting that sociologists, people who study what brings workers true uh, happiness in their jobs, true contentment, um, it's not money. No. It's actually no, the knowledge that you're making a difference. Mm. That yeah. you're making a difference. Mm. Talk about that and your experiences with that. Uh, we were people of doers and not complainers. So you just need to uh, get things done. Uh, not to wait for a change and not to wait for the opportunity. Uh, all of my, I have many friends who are complaining, who will give me the opportunity? I'm waiting for the best opportunity. When, if you want to wait, you will get old. <laughs> Create the opportunity. And that's the key. Uh, we have a society, and democracy and, and uh, freedom, where we can do the change and we can do a lot. Not to wait for somebody. Uh, changing your life, you have to do it, and uh, I think small countries can do it. Thomas, well, <laughs> I don't. Know, I guess my whole life I've been dealing with things that are not possible. You know, sort of uh, people telling me don't you bother. You specialize in it. Mm. Well, I, I worked. Uh, I was an analyst at Radio Free Europe in the eighties, and uh, and I remember I, w I was told by the director that. Yeah, you're really smart, but your your country will never become independent. So there's no point. Why don't you work on this other topic? Because <laughs> wow. you write well, but uh, let's be honest. We know this will never change. So mm -hmm. don't. Uh, and I said, no. <laughs> so I mean, it's it's been like that all along. Now I didn't ask you, Robert, before we started. Are we taking audience questions? I guess so. Do we have a microphone? I don't even know if we are set up. With we are, I, because I didn't want us to run out of time before we go to the audience. So why don't we take a moment now? Um, any of you who would like to and uh, raise your hand and identify yourself, please. Uh, microphone, we have a question right here. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Hello? Is it working? Or yes? I think it's yes. on now. Yeah, OK, thank you. Uh, my name is Anna. I'm Ukrainian. I would like to ask a question to Mr. Avos. Um, I've been to Estonia in 2013, and uh, I always went traveling. I enjoy talking to people. And what I've learned from uh, all the generation of your country is that uh, as any small country of the European Union, you suffer a bit from the uh, that youth leaves your country looking for better opportunities elsewhere. And my question is, uh, with all this IT development, how do you manage to keep youth in your country? for example, in comparison to other Baltic countries? And uh, uh, how are you successful with attraction of uh, foreigners who would uh, develop startups in IT in Estonia? Thank you. Well, compared to the other Baltic countries, we certainly have a much lower rate of emigration than, let's say, Latvia and Lithuania. Which, uh, But that is due to factors that are completely different. It's just that uh, we had Finland, so we had people, and, we, and it's a... Estonian and Finnish are very funny languages, but we understand each other. And so people went to Finland in the 90s, and then they sort of realized it's not, it's not El Dorado, even though it's <laughs> one of the richest countries. And so, pe so people do go abroad. But much more important than this is something which is a political decision where we need really U Europe to do something. And I'll tell you a true story, which is that, because uh, I'm always trying to, you know, when I, the young people do interesting things, I invite them to, for tea or coffee. And I read the story about this 24-year-old kid who, would, who had gotten $300,000 for a startup. 
And so I invited him to coffee, and he said, well, yeah, he told me what he was doing. He had this great idea and, uh, for, for engineering software. Uh, and he said, but, Mr. President, I'm sorry to tell you, I'm leaving in two weeks, and I'm moving to the United States. Okay, well, what, what <laughs> happened? I mean, he, he went to the United States, and uh, in six months, he had raised $4.6 million. <whistles> Last October, after he'd been away for three years, he sold his company for $100 million. Wow. So this is, and this is a story repeated over and over again throughout Europe. Why do these people go there? They go there because two reasons. One is because the U.S. market is $330 million. The European Union is 500 million people, but we do not have a digital single market. It is easier to take a bottle of wine from the Algarve in southern Portugal, ship it up to north of the Arctic Circle in Lapland than it is for you, uh, I mean for a Slovak, to buy an iTunes record for a friend, I mean for a Bratislava, and to buy one for a friend in, uh, in Vienna. You can't do it. Uh, because we don't have a single market. And one of the key th in digital services, one of the key, I mean, unless we get a digital single market in Europe with 500 mil a market of 500 million, we will see our people leave. I, t I told my story to Neely Cruz, who was in charge of, di of digitization in Europe at the commission. I mean, then the commission, now there's a new person who happens to be Estonian. But anyway, she told me that, she, yes, I had the same thing. I, w I was in... Portugal, and I went to a government-funded incubator with 45 startups, and every single one told me, that's I mean her, that as soon as I get my startup capital, I'm moving to the United States. So this is, it, when I said, uh, I think that often it's the legal environment that determines whether you can or cannot do things. We live in a continent, we live in a European Union in which the largest market possible is 80 million. It's Germany. Uh, and countries like Hungary, Slovakia, mine, it is not possible to have a successful startup with, with lots and lots of people because we, if it's a service-oriented thing, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a political thing that we have to push and you have to push is to get a digital single market. And this is, when, this is one of these things people say, oh, the European Union is all bureaucracy. Yes, it is. But what, if you want to create a digital single market, and if we want to compete with 330 million in the United States, and we want to compete with you know, 1.3 billion in China, um, then where Alibaba is this IT company that's like the, the biggest in the world, uh, then we have, to make, we have to make big changes in Europe. And that way people will stay here because they think, well, if I do this thing in Europe, I'm not going to have to go away. I don't have to go to the United States. Um, so you create job, <coughs> create jobs right. here. You bring money right. here. You don't have this terrible brain drain. Right. So this, uh, but this brain drain of, s especially in IT, of people going to Silicon Valley or going to Route 128 in Boston, uh, it's terrible. I mean, it really is because. But that's how can you blame them? That's where the opportunities are. Um, so if you have a, I mean, we see this all throughout Europe. It, I mean, it's no less, it's no more or less true in my country than it is in Germany. A lot of Germans, you know, the richest people, move to the United States because they see they can't do anything, they can't do it here. And you probably have similar experiences. This was as a clear line or two. We did open our U.S. office right away. We started. We kept this one because we love our, yeah. we wanted to do something good here, but it would have been probably easier just to have it there. And this was, you know, we just did the numbers. It's a huge single culture market, more or less. It's just impossible. You know, if even if we do something great, somebody copies us half a year later in the US, they can outgrow us in a few months. Yeah. Well, our guys all basically keep their developers in my country, <laughs> but their offices are there. <laughs> Another question? I thought I saw another hand um, right down here, lady in the red dress. Good afternoon. My name is Magda. Um, um, I have uh, two questions. One question is to Mr. President. I visited your country 13 years ago, and that was the start of the, start of the, of the voting process through Internet. And uh, I remember there was a fantastic atmosphere and uh, 
everybody everybody thought that uh, that will be that will be 50 60 percent of the population voting on internet and uh, as you as you men as you've mentioned uh, there is uh, today 35 percent what's the what's the matter behind it that also in your country there is not possible to overcome 50 percent of internet voting there is something as a burden or or something so uh, and uh, for two for robert and adam and uh, no, there was really nobody from the older generation behind your startups you were really alone uh, yes yes this is uh, an easy uh, answer this yes. is my question of the of, uh, of the of the probably oldest here yes Thank you very much. I think I'm the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you want to take on that voting question? I'm 61. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just quickly, I mean, it looks like uh, 35, 33% is the, right now, was the first, it increased every election and then it, it has leveled <laughs> off for the last three elections at 33 to 35. Um, you know, a lot of people, have a thing about voting, going to the voting booth and voting. I mean, it's the people who use this are tend to be well. I mean, we've now done so studies, and it's it's left to right, it's evenly distributed. Old to young to old, it's evenly distributed. But some people just like to go and you know do the thing of going to vote because I mean. I vote online. It uh, actually is not very romantic. You just, you know, you, you <laughs> log in and you press the thing and it's like you're done. Whereas people, I mean, people like to go to the polling station. It's like you, they feel a part of the process. And I understand that. So, I mean, right now we're, you know, as I said, we're doing 33, 35, election to election. And, well, but it does have other things that uh, advantages. So, for example, uh, you can vote anywhere in the world. I mean, one time I actually voted online simply because I was on a visit to another country and I had to vote. Well, okay. Uh, and it means that you can, your citizens abroad can participate much more easily because if you're like living in the United States, for example, and you're not living where there's a consulate and you only have three, I mean, so you can't really. So, I mean, you're not going to. Um, I know a friend of mine who's uh, the former CEO of Skype voted online in, uh, Pal in Palo Alto. And he was being visited by a Finn who said, the only way I can vote is driving 450 miles down to the consul in L.A. So he didn't get to vote. In his election, we get to vote. So, I mean, it's... Um, more questions? No, there's... There okay, did you, Adam, age, did you want... Age. No, I mean... Oh, she said... No? I, answer, <laughs> I think short answers are good, no? <laughs> okay. Okay, more questions here? I will answer okay, that as well, because that, that, that went okay. to me, I think, as well. Uh, okay. Uh, and my answer is a little bit uh, more complicated. Behind the idea, there was nobody. There was this, this was a true student project from Banska Bystrica. But as you know, when you need to develop a startup, you s need to start to fundraise. You need to start to look for people and partners uh, whom you can group around your idea because you're unable pu to push that through in such a complicated world uh, as diplomatic world is. Mm -hmm. And we needed to start to look for right persons who will be able to help us in develop the idea. So the first was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and you were the State Secretary whom we, uh, we persuaded that you need to uh, provide us with the uh, with the premises of the MFA for the first Globsec. So I remember that very well. And uh, our discussions were very inspirational uh, at that time. Later on, uh, I have persuaded Ambassador Asis Alkacher to join our, uh, our board as a president. And there were many others who joined later. But that's about building uh, a trusted organization you can't do it alone because you're not the expert for everything. You can have a great idea, you can motivate people, but then you need a larger group of allies who will be fighting towards your idea. So this is really a big, big endeavor with uh, around 70 partners that we have today uh, build up around Globsec. 
They are coming from a lot of European and uh, European countries, from United States, etc. So, but to persuade people at the beginning, it was extremely, extremely hard. But also, it was hard for some of those who have invested money into us because it it was risky as well, because those who invested time and energy into us at the beginning, they couldn't know whether we will uh, grow it into something uh, that is worth in a few years. So they were brave enough as well. I think so. One, I, one thing I would say also is that uh, one, of the, is the, one of the benefits of getting old is, you, is, is wisdom. And one of the things that I learned as a former young person, always younger than all of the other people around me, uh, and always having to fight because they would say, oh, you wouldn't, you don't know. I mean, the, my life has consisted of doing things where I'm the youngest and they look at me and they go, what? Uh, so that, and I, I, that was so frustrating um, that now I sort of see that and when I see young people doing stuff, I want to support them so they don't go through this thing that I went through where, you know, I was, by 20 years, I was the youngest person at Radio Free Europe doing what I was doing and it was, sh sh you don't know anything. And I was, it, it was so frustrating that, uh, that I, I, don't, I don't want to do that to other people who, have, who are young and I never want to use age as a, as a, a way to hit people on the head, saying, preventing them from doing what they should be doing. Okay. So, um, more questions? Let's see if we have anyone. Okay, right here, another one. You mm -hmm. absolutely know. Um, I also have one question to Mr. President because um, recently uh, Yannicka Marilo from Estonia, who. Yannicka Marilo, uh, I don't know if I pronounce it properly. Um, uh, she, j she came to Ukraine uh, sh sharing her experience in development of electronic government system. And I would like to ask, are there any other countries which you are helping in such a generous way to develop similar system in their countries? Oh, there are lots. Uh, in fact, we have, a, uh, we have a, an e-governance academy that's had, about, had, had people from over 80 countries come to study um, what we do. Uh, we, as a, we have, we've done... Uh, I mean, we've set, went and done things at, in the Palestinian Authority, in Moldova, in Tunisia, um, most clearly. On the other hand, we were visited by the Minister of Government for the United Kingdom, Francis Maud, who was very skeptical, and he visited us, and he was there for three days, and then he said, why don't you send us someone, second someone to the to my office for a month or two, and 10 months later, he was still there. He did come back. But I mean, so it's not simply that you are, that, that you know, we're going around to c developing countries and <coughs> um, assisting them. We also, countries more developed than we are. Or another example, which uh, was that Finland was going to actually buy for, a, for 600 million euros a, um, a proprietary closed source uh, operating system to manage their health care. And then they realized that, in fact, we have an open source, non proprietary software that you can modify all you want and works better. And so, we, I mean, so Finland, which is, you know, far richer than we are, opted for our system because <laughs> it was cheaper and better. So, I mean, it's, it's in IT, this is, I guess, the one lesson in IT is that uh, for me, which I and which is why I keep talking about it, is that it doesn't matter. You don't have to be the richest country in the world in order to do something neat, innovative, and cool that then becomes take is taken up by other people. So yes, we do go around to all all kinds of places, invite people to come with us um, to come, and we also actually offer now the uh, up till now the sole master's degree in e-governance, which is really a core a combined degree in IT. I mean, learning to, you know, code and do all that stuff, and uh, and then a master's in public administration because 
the big revolution that is yet to happen in this world is that we still live in a serial paper world where papers go from one place to a second place and each place you get, and especially in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, <laughs> you get a stamp on it and then it goes to the next office. Whereas all of this is possible instantaneously virtually if you do it in parallel and using the right kind of uh, operating system. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for sharing your inspiring stories today. And I, I'd like you to just briefly, when you look at the future of this region, what most inspires you? Do you see any central storyline emerging as we look at the future? Robert? <laughs> central storyline, only one. I, th I think there will be a lot of stories, but uh, what I would wish for is that uh, our region will not be on the periphery anymore. We want to be the drivers of the European and transatlantic agenda, not to be just followers. So I think that should be the storyline. Uh, try to be the first, one or two steps ahead. Uh, don't wait for solutions for from, from the Western uh, capitals. Let's put them on the table. Let's try to do everything for that. Adam? I hope the, the future global citizen, its culture uh, and his culture, will be a little bit more humble and a little bit more collectivistic than if he don't succeed. Think about the we versus the me. Mm? Mm. Thomas? Uh, I mean, I, I think that we, uh, we have to get over our sort of uh, our feelings of inferiority and inadequacy because we're small or because you know we came later to the game than others and there will always be people who will exploit that just as there are people who exploit their age to against young people there are countries that will say well you're tiny what can you do oh you're you don't really you know uh, you don't really get it because we're you know an old democracy um, I've actually, I mean, there's a lot of that. In fact, but you I can be the mouse that roared, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, well, sometimes I feel like we're the Grand Duchy of Fenwick in my country, but it's, uh, but the, uh, but I mean, the point is that there, uh, there are a lot of people who are, who, d who are, you know, who have been doing something a certain way for decades and centuries and really are, don't think that uh, you know they have anything to learn from other people, which means it's just more of a battle. But I think if you have a good idea, if your idea is better, you will ultimately win, but it means it's not easy. Uh, it's not gonna be easy getting a digital single market uh, where people don't, wanna ha don't really understand computers. Um, so that means you have to keep pushing and work, you have to work harder at it. Thomas, Robert. Adam, thank you all so much. And I want to conclude with an interesting quote I found online, actually from one of your professors in Stockholm at the Royal Institute of Technology who said something, and I hope this quote is correct because I found it very inspirational. It is not your job to solve problems that people give you. You can build visions. So don't ask for problems because they will become your limit. Mm. So thank you for joining us. Go out there and build some visions. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.